Michelangelo, he created four sculptures that he never finished, okay? And there are four sculptures of slaves. And these sculptures, if you get a chance to look at them, they're sculptures that it, it, it's like they're breaking out of this mold that they can't quite break out. He's kind of partially finished them, but they're still stuck in that place of the, the slab of marble. And I think that many times for us as believers, and I don't know if you guys have gone through this, I don't know if you ever have experienced this, but there is this breakthrough that you're waiting for. Have you guys ever experienced that? Raise your hand if you have. Okay, I'm not the only one. Okay, I want to make sure I'm not just speaking to myself. You know, we want breakthrough. We want to get through this thing in our life, that thing that maybe is holding us back. Maybe it's a fear. Maybe it's a, it's a, it's a sin or a struggle. Maybe it's whatever it is that that is. God wants to break us out of it. He wants to create in you the very creation that he's seen in your life. Just like Michelangelo would see a piece of slab of marble and then he would say, this is what I see in that marble even before anybody else did. And then he would start chipping away. And that's what God wants us to do in us as well. In 2 Peter, I want to just kind of read this real quick as we read it together. In verse 3 of chapter 1, it says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises." that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So here, Peter is saying that his divine power has given us all things, everything that we need for godliness, everything we need to, to work out those things in our life, the things that would cover uh, all of our struggles and our sins, and he says that he wants to bring those things out exceedingly and great in a great way through his precious promises. So God has given us promises, amen? amen? And the things that we forget many times are those promises. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you, right? That's a promise. And a lot of times we put that on a bumper sticker or refrigerator magnet, whatever, and we go, yeah, okay, that's just a cool little nifty saying. That's a promise from God. He will never leave you, ever, 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 ever leave you nor forsake you. But sometimes we do feel left and we feel forsaken. God, where are you in this situation? Why aren't you here? But he's there, right? And he's given us all things. And I want you to underline that word, all things. Because I think a lot of times we feel like, well, I don't have that. Or I don't know this. But God says, I've given you all things. Amen? Amen. And so out of this, I want to I springboard, if you will, into Psalm 119. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 119. And we're going to camp out on four verses there. Psalm 119, verse, verse 112 through 114, that's where we'll be. He says in those verses, let me get this open here. And first of all, Psalm 119 is the longest psalm, the longest uh, chapter in the whole Bible, right? It has been said in tradition that David used this psalm to teach his son Solomon the alphabet, but a spiritual alphabet of life, okay? So Psalm 119 is rich and so much valuable knowledge and wisdom that God has in God's Word and his laws and his, and his heart runs through it all. But what I want to share with you, and if you're taking notes, I hope you are, is four habits for a sure calling. Four habits for a sure calling. Four ways that you can know that you know that you know that God has called you, that God has empowered you, that God is with you and he wants to continue to grow you in this way. Four ways for a sure calling. Let's read Psalm 112 through one, or 119, verses 112. He says, I have inclined my heart to perform your statues forever to the very end. And then he goes into and he says, 113, he says, I hate the double minded, but I love your law. 114, you are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. I hope in your word. 
Notice, first of all, that we must incline our heart. That's the very first principle. Now, what does it mean to incline your heart? Because I think a lot of times we, we think, well, what does that mean? Now, if, if something doesn't need to be inclined, how many of you guys, are, how many of you guys lift weights? Anybody here? You guys are embarrassed to say it. Huh? Just come on, just say it. I lift weights too, but my body doesn't show it, all right? <laughs> it's like only the big guys, oh, I lift weights, you know, they pick up their head. Okay, so you lift weights or you ever have in your life. There's the incline bench, right? Right? There's the flat bench and you're doing this and then there's the incline. You know, it works out a different muscle and all that kind of stuff. But let me just say, okay, if I'm talking to Ed and I'm like this, I, I think he's got my full attention, right? But let's just say I'm kind of like, you know, after a while I'm kind of like this. And he's talking, he's talking. You know, next thing you know I'm like this. <sighs> Yeah, keep talking, Ed. I, I hear you. Do you think he, he has really got my attention? Probably not. And so this whole principle of inclining your heart, it's, it's sitting upright. It's taking notice. It's, it's being intentional about resetting your heart, if you will. Resetting your heart. And I think that many times as we have been walking with Christ for so many years, we tend to lean back, kick back. We tend to relax. We tend to casually just even come to church sometimes and we're just like, yeah, yeah, whatever. I've heard that before. Oh, yeah, keep talking, keep talking. You know, the word of God is rich. It's alive. It's powerful. It says that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts through the heart, through the bone, through the marrow, all those things. Has it cut you lately? Has it cut you lately? Has it cut me and we have to be careful that we don't just decline our heart, but we incline our heart. We adjust, we reset our heart. How many of you guys remember, and I'll probably date myself, there was that famous infomercial for like, I think it was a chicken rotisserie thing, and it said, set it and forget it. Yeah, very good. Who said that? All right, see, yeah, you knew it, see? We're tracking. We saw, you know, those commercials stay with us, right? Set it and forget it, Right? But that's not what you do with your heart. You don't just set it once and forget it. You don't just come to Jesus once and go, oh, yeah, that's good. That's all I have to do. No, we constantly have to check our heart. Because here he's saying, I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever to the very end. It's continual. It's a continual verb of continual uh, resetting of our hearts. Why do we need to incline our heart? Let me tell you why. Let me suggest three things. Because our hearts will be tempted to default to our default position discouragement, despair, and dysfunction. We always go to those three. We get discouraged. Oh, I'm not, I messed up. Oh, I, I just yelled at my kids. I kicked my dog or oh, whatever. I messed up at work. So you get discouraged, right? And then your heart gets like heavy and you know, it's like, oh God, I, I, you know, I, I'm not connecting with you. So I'm, I get discouraged. What about despair? God, how am I gonna pay my mortgage this month? You know, I, I haven't been working lately. I don't know. Or, you know, my, my, my wife and I are fighting. We don't know how to get this thing together. I'm despairing instead of inclining my heart. So our default positions go to the three Ds. And then we go to dysfunction. We go to the habits in our life, right? Maybe yours is alcohol, drugs, whatever your background was. Maybe it's just withdrawal. Whatever those things are, we go back to those things instead of inclining our heart. Like the psalmist says, he says, I have inclined my heart. I'm resetting that position. I am getting ready to hear from you, God, what your statues are. Resetting my priorities, resetting my life. That's the very first thing that we need to do is to reset our heart. Proverbs says we need to guard our hearts, right? Our hearts are deceitfully wicked. I can't trust my heart for, for beans because my heart's going to go, oh, I want this. Oh, I like that. Oh, I don't want that. Or, you know, it's going to be all over the place. It's going to be like a ping pong ball. And some of you, especially young people, where people say, follow your heart, go after it. Don't follow your heart. <laughs> follow God's word because your heart will lead you to a bad relationship. Your heart will lead you to a bad decision because you thought your heart was telling you to do this. It's like, what is God telling you to do, Right? We need to incline our hearts. That's the very first thing. Our hearts are a very important part of our spiritual being. It's, it's the condition of our heart that really sets our tone and our, and our path with God. Where is your heart this morning? I remember getting a, a physical a while back from a, the doctor. And, you know, 
you know, she, she was an older doctor. God bless her. She was probably like 80 years old. I don't know. But she was a wonderful doctor. Just, you know, I, didn't, I don't normally have a female doctor. She happened to fill in for uh, my doctor wasn't there. So it was a little awkward, you know. It's like, you know, okay, <laughs> talking about male things, you know, stuff like that. We're talking. But one of the things that she said was, she goes, oh, you look pretty healthy. I'm like, oh, thank you. You know, I was like, <laughs> you know, I was like all right, I guess I look all right, you know, just look healthy. She said, but there's a couple of things on your test and a couple of things that, you know, your heart and your, you know, I'm, I'm good, you know, don't, I'm not like sick or anything, but just, you know, <laughs> things, you know, cholesterol, whatever, things, you know, it's like, okay, I'm at that age where I got to watch a little bit more what, what I eat and stuff. So the condition, the test, reveal what's inside, right? And even though you may look good from the outside, you may look real spiritual, you may carry the biggest Bible in town, you may know all the scriptures, you know all that, but what's the condition of your heart, right? We need to incline our heart. That's the very first thing, the condition, the spiritual condition of our heart. The second thing he says right here, he says, I hate the double-minded. I hate is in the Bible, you guys. I hate it. What does he mean here? He's, he's talking about the things that we're supposed to hate. Okay, I don't know what that is for you in your life. I know what they are for me in my life. But sometimes we love what we're supposed to hate and we hate what we're supposed to love. Like for instance, I hate cardio, okay? I hate it. Don't, I mean, you ask me to run, and it's like, oh, you might as well put a bullet in my head. It's like, I hate it, but I know I should love it, especially at my age. I got to run. I got to do stuff. I got to get be active, whatever, all that stuff the doctor said, but I hate it, and there's certain things in our life that we love, but we're, we're supposed to hate. Like, for instance, I love chocolate. I love chocolate, like anything chocolate. So if you ever want to get on my good side, just chocolate, anything, you know. Chocolate this, chocolate that. But I love it too much. Like my, my, my wife will tell you, I'll, I'll eat the whole box, or I'll eat the whole ice cream thing. You know, it's just, I got to really be cool. I can't do that, you know. Um, but you get what I'm saying. There's certain things that we love that we're supposed to hate and vice versa. Let me give you an example. David, he loved Absalom. Yes, he loved his son Absalom with all of his heart, mind, and soul. He would give up his throne for Absalom. But Absalom was trying to kill David. That's a hard thing for us. The very thing that's trying to kill you, that's trying to destroy you, you may be so attached to it that you don't even realize it. Remember when when Absalom was coming against David and and, and, and he was crying, and he was all depressed. And Joab, Joab, his general, got in his face and says, David, get a hold of yourself. You love the son that is trying to kill you and the people that are trying to protect you and want to battle for you. you you're, you're like, you just put them off to the side. They need you right now to fill your place as king and go thank the people that fought for you. You see, that's a rude awakening for us. Because for me, there's those things that I don't see. They're my blind spots. They're the things that sometimes I feel like, oh, yeah, I got that. It's good. But I'm so blinded to that that I love it and I should hate it. And he says, I hate the double-minded. That's the same principle. We say we love it. We say we hate it. But then we're back and forth and we're ping-ponging back because our heart isn't ready to receive it. First of all, we become double-minded. And God hates the double-minded. He hates when we say we love him with our lips but yet our actions say something different. And I'm not talking about perfection, you guys, so don't, don't, don't even think that. None of us here are perfect. None of us have this down right, perfect, you know, tight. But we know that there's certain things in our life that we should be totally against. Hate is a powerful motivator, actually. Have you ever heard when somebody hits rock bottom, then they're ready to change, Right? How many of you guys came from an alcohol, drug addiction, whatever? I did. Not so much alcohol, but drugs. Until I got to the point where I had to hate it. And I did that many times. I hit rock bottom so many times. And then I trusted in God's grace and his love. And I said, I hate this. I can't stand this anymore. I don't want this anymore. But I want you, Jesus. I want you in my life. At that moment was when God started to change the trajectory of my life. 
But I had a lot of friends that said they hated it too, and they didn't change because they kept going back to it, back and forth, back and forth, right? Double-minded. Go to church, party all day, and then go to church and party. You know what I mean? It was that kind of thing. And, and God, God bless them because I was there too, and I was ping-ponging back and forth until that time when I finally just said, oh, I just hate it all. I love God. I want to love God. I want to know what that means. And God has been taking me through that journey all ever since. So hate, hating is a, is a, is a, is a powerful, powerful, powerful tool. Let me give you another uh, example. The third thing is you got to know where to hide. He says, you are my hiding place and my shield. You are my hiding place and my shield. What is your hiding place? Think about that for a moment. Just let it kind of settle in. What is your hiding place? What do you do when things get rough? Where do you go? What do you start thinking? What do you start doing? What, what is it that we all do? We all have hiding places. I think when those hiding places come in our life, we go into that place and we start to feel discouraged. We start to feel like we got to hide out somewhere. Elijah, remember Elijah, the great prophet, calling fire from heaven and saying, boom. I mean, I wish I could do that. That would be so awesome, right? It's like, you know, like in the middle of something crazy, evil and everything, he's just like, God, show up right here, right now. Boom, you know, do that. Elijah did that. And it happened. And it was a powerful message to the prophets of Baal. The prophets of Baal didn't have an answer for it. They were killed and slaughtered. The king was like, whoa, like crazy. But then Jezebel comes in and says, I'm going to kill you, Elijah. I'm coming after you. She just threatens him. She doesn't even do it, right? And what does Elijah do? He runs and he hides. He hides and he hides in a cave. And he's running and he's scared. After you just saw God move mightily in your life like that, Elijah, did I not protect you from the prophets of Mount Carmel? Did I not stop the rain so there would be a drought and then bring the rain back? Did I not do these mighty things in your life? Think about what God has done in your life. Think about one thing. And I'm sure there's many more than one thing, right? Think about that one thing that you go, wow, God. Like, pfft. that one thing you did, God? Maybe it was 10 years ago, 10 minutes ago. I don't know. Whatever it was, but you think about it. Well, let me say something. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he may do something really crazy radical today too, or he may not. He may wait and choose to give you, get you through this trial, whatever. But he's the same God, right? The promises of God are faithful and true always. That's why the psalmist is going, he says, you are my hiding place, God. When things get rough, when things get crazy and I don't understand it, when I'm going through something, I run to you. You are my hiding place instead of running to whatever it is the drug, or the, the bottle, or maybe it's self-pity. Some of us say, well, I got no vices. I don't smoke, drink, do drugs, whatever. But let me say, what about anger? What about disillusionment? Maybe cynicism in God. Maybe it's a place of, you know, where all you do is complain about everything and everyone else. I, I, I gave this message a while back at uh, a church in in Colorado, and, and a lady came up to me after and said, my hiding place is blame. She says, I blame everybody for my life. I blame my, my parents for the way they raised me. I blame my husband for the way he is. I blame my boss for the way he treats me. I blame, 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 but I'm comfortable in this little hiding place of blame. And I'm like, wow. Even blame can be a hiding place, you guys. Because pretty soon we put all the blame on everything else. And, and you know what that does? It removes me of all responsibility, right? Because it's all your guys' fault, right? It's not my fault. I'm good. You guys are bad. It makes us feel good. And so whatever that hiding place is, it should not be unless it's God. We trust in him. We hide ourselves in his word. We hide ourselves in the, the shadow of his wing, we get comfort from him. We, we seek his counsel. We go to him for all these things. Elijah was running from his conflict with Jezebel. But let me say this. The very place of conflict 
is the place of conf- is the place of calling. You want to know that you're called? Stand fast in the calling, in the conflict. Stand fast through that trial. Don't run from it. Because Elijah, the same God was with him that, you know, was in the fire that he called down from heaven was the same time when she threatened him. But he ran from his calling. He should have stayed. And he should have combated that and said, you know what? I don't, you got nothing on me. God is with me. And sometimes for us, we shrink back instead of being in that conflict. And I'm not saying every conflict is the calling of God. There's some that we just, we create ourselves. But sometimes God has us in a place where it's difficult and we have to wrestle through it. There's a conflict. And in that place is the very place of our calling. You know why? Because people are watching you. Just like Paul being on the island of Malta and, you know, the snake comes up and bites him and he just shakes it off. Boom. And the barbarians, at first they thought, you know, this guy's cursed and everything because he got shipwrecked and he's ended up here. And then all of a sudden now they're, man, this guy must be a god. Look at what's happening. He didn't die. But see, that's what people are watching us every day of our life. How do you respond in the conflict? How do you respond in that difficult time? Are you running or are you staying and are you resting in your calling? The safest place might be right in the middle of that conflict. So what is your hiding place? I was, uh, I was doing a youth ministry for a while uh, at a church in Colorado. And uh, we played a game. <clears throat> it was kind of hide, a hide-and-seek game. And uh, one of the junior high girls um, hid, and it was at the church, hid in a trash can. Okay? And she was really tiny, real small and everything. She hid in there. And one of the leaders saw where she hid, so we knew it. You know, it was like, oh, we know where she's at. And so... We were like, okay, well, let's, you know, we we're evil and bad youth ministers, okay? We're like, let's mess with her, right? So one of the guys, like, got a can of Coke and stuff and just, you know, like, you know, just poured it down and stuff and nothing. She didn't squirm. She didn't move. I mean, she was good, you know? I thought she'd be like, oh, you know, whatever. You know, uh, one of the other youth guys had a little baby. They had a dirty, stinky diaper. He threw that in there. I mean, you can imagine, right? You know, like, oh, gosh. God, forgive me. He's already forgiven me for this. <laughs> but, but she didn't move. And, then, you know, one thing after another, and we're all like, you know, we're just like waiting, you know, for her to pop out any moment now, and all mess, you know, all full of stuff. And she never came out. And I think about that. Sometimes we're the same way. We're hiding in our trash can. All the gunk is pouring out on us, and we don't come out. And we say, God, I need you. That's a powerful lesson for us. Because we get so comfortable with whatever it was. And her thing maybe was pride and she wanted to win. You know? So it's like, you know, I'm not going to move, you know, whatever. And sometimes we get stuck in our pride. Oh, you know, I'm not going to budge. My wife is wrong. I'm right, you know, whatever. Maybe God wants you to humble yourself and go to your wife or your husband or whoever. But we get so stuck in the trash can. And all the gunk and junk and the stinky stuff, all that stuff, and it doesn't even phase us. What's your hiding place? It shouldn't be in that trash can. The fourth thing, we got to know how to hope. Know how to hope because he says, you, he says, first of all, you are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. I hope in your word. There is a difference. He says, I hope. When the psalmist says, I have hope, that's different. But when he says, I hope, it's a verb, it's active. It means he's practicing it. He's actually living it out. And so many times I want to say I have hope. The world is like that, you know, hope for the best, but, you know, expect the worst, whatever. That's kind of a wishy-washy, worldly kind of hope. But when I can stand and say, you know what, I hope. I hope in God. I hope and trust in him. There's an active faith. That's the verb that he's talking about. I am, I hope in this situation, I hope through this whole thing that God is going to show up. Have you guys ever probably heard this uh, uh, illustration before? They did a test with uh, lab rats and they put a bunch of lab rats and wanted to figure out how many, uh, how long would it take before they drowned? Pretty sick experiment. 
And so they would throw them in some water, and the rats would be, you know, poor little things just going for it, you know, like trying to do their thing. And, you know, then they would sink and drown, and I think, I forget the time. It was probably like five minutes, and it's like, oh, okay, you know, scientists are all taking down the things and going, five minutes, five minutes. And then they started to do something different. They threw the rat, other rats in, and they, as soon as they started to go down, they would take them out and give them some time to rest and give them some food and encourage them and then put them back in, boom, and then let them swim some longer, you know, see how fast, how long they could swim. They found out that those rats would swim a whole lot longer because they were hoping to be rescued. They were hoping to have somebody take them out. So they would go past what they couldn't, they felt like, you know, the first batch, they just drowned. They just downed, okay, I'm down, because they had no hope. But the other batches had hope. And I think for us too, how many times has God taken his mighty hand and just rescued me out of the pit, out of the situation, at the very right time? Not the time that I thought, because I was at five minutes going, oh, Lord, you know, like, God, you know, I can't do this. The Bible says you, I'll, I won't give you more than you can handle. Well, guess what? He will give you more than you can handle because you think you can't handle it, but he knows he can handle it through you. See, there's a, kind of a, a little misconception with that scripture. A lot of people use that and go, well, he said he wouldn't give me more than I can handle, and this is kind of rough. I don't feel like I can handle it. He's like, I'm saying, God can handle this. You don't think you can handle it, but he knows you can handle it because he is with you. And he always brings us, just stretches us a little bit more, just a little bit longer, right? And if you're going through that, just trust that God is going to come in. He's going to rescue you. This in Proverbs 13, 12, it says this in the New Living Translation. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. I, get, I lose hope. I'm, I'm, my heart is sick. It's like having a cold or cancer or something worse, and your heart is sick. It's not healthy because you have no hope. A hopeless Christian is a, is a, is a pitiful person. And I, don't get me wrong, I don't, I'm not saying we've got to walk around, everything's always got to be perfect, and we're so, but let me say something, that God is a God of hope. Because we have hope, Christians, we have hope, believers, the world doesn't. Their hope is in their stuff. Their hope is in their, whatever they think their hope is in. And we walk around sometimes like we're hopeless and they're not. That's not, that's not right. Our hope is in Christ. Our hope is that we know who we serve. We know the God of the, the Almighty, the one that created everything. And then he says, but a dream fulfilled is a tree, is a tree of life. Notice that. Your dream. What have you dreamt lately? Have you given up on your dream? And I'm not talking about, you know, I dreamt that, you know, I, I should be a rock star or whatever. I mean, I don't know. If that's what God has for you, praise the Lord. Go for it. You know, or I dreamt that I should have a Ferrari, a Lamborghini, or whatever. Okay, great, awesome. Maybe God has that for you. But what is your spiritual dream for your life? What is God calling you to do? What is he calling you to be? It doesn't mean you got to be a pastor or a missionary or whatever. Some people, I don't want to be a missionary because they may call me to Africa. You know, it's like, what's wrong with Africa? <laughs> I've been there a lot of times. It's actually pretty cool. They love Jesus more than we'll ever know. I'll tell you that. They're so in love with Jesus there. But anyways, I don't think he'll call you to Africa. He'll, he'll give you the desires of your heart because your heart has inclined to the Lord. Your heart is, is hearing from the Lord. Your heart is in line with what his will is for your life. So therefore, your dream, your passion will be fulfilled. And dreams aren't bad. Goals aren't bad. It's good to have those things. And he says it's like a tree of life. How many trees were in the garden? There was probably more, but we, we, hear, we read two, right? The tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And which one did we choose? <laughs> we chose the wrong one. What would have happened in, if they had just chose the tree of life? Because God didn't say, don't, don't eat the tree of life. He just said, of this one here, don't eat it. So you had two choices in the garden. And same thing with here. We have a dream. We have life. We have a tree. We know that the tree represents even Christ, Jesus on the cross. That's the tree of life. We have that choice in our life. We get to go after it passionately with everything we are, everything that we be, that we believe, that we breathe, everything. We get to do that. But we go for this tree. Oh, I want knowledge. 
I want wisdom. I want to know stuff. I want, I want this. I want that. And we go after the flesh when we should be going after the tree of life. The tree of life gives us hope. It gives us encouragement. It gives us desire that is lined up with Christ. Desire without discipline is a disaster. It must be tempered with discipline to know God's will for our desires. If your desire is about God and about his will and his things for your life, then it's a good thing. If it's turned towards the things of this world and the things of this, this, what this life offers, then it's, I would say it's, it's wrong because it's going to take you down paths and, and crazy, way, crazy areas that you don't really want to go down. You see, the hope is something that builds faith. It says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith. God wants to build your faith, church. He wants to build my faith. He wants us to take radical steps out in faith and go, God, I trust that you're here and you're going to do something crazy because I can't do anything. But he needs the church to advance. In the Bible, you know what Jesus says, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Guess what, church? Gates don't come running at you. You go running towards the gate. Okay? So we sometimes wait, well, the gates are throwing, they're throwing gates at me. You know, it's like, no, no. Gates are made to hold and protect, right? The gates of hell are holding captives. They're locking them in. And it says, the church, those gates will not prevail against us, church. We got to head towards those gates and we got to go full throttle with everything we are, everything that we believe, with our faith, with our trust, with hope. We got to incline our hearts so we know that God is going to do something crazy radical and he's going to set the captives free. The other day we were eating at a restaurant here and I wish I could show a picture of it, but I went to the restroom. There was a sign of a, a transgender bathroom, right? It's the first time I've ever seen it. I don't know, maybe you guys have seen it all the time. And, you know, it was kind of like, what? You know, it was like, Kind of threw me off when I was going in there. I was like, am I in the right place? You know, it's like, yeah, it's because I had male, female, half male, female, whatever you want, and then handicapped. So it's actually for whatever you think you, you are, I guess. Just go in. And at first, my heart was grieved. I was like, oh, like we're, we're there, guys. Church, we're here. Did you ever think we'd have a bathroom like that? I never did. But then my heart started to, to, to feel a sense of, Wow, like we get to live in this time. People are lost. Their identity is, is all jacked up. They don't even know who they are anymore. Male, female, this, that, whatever. And we have the answer. We have the antidote. Christ Jesus. And so sometimes I go, I get bummed like, oh, you know, I don't want to see that stuff. I want, I want paradise here, man. I want, I want to live in a Christian bubble. I want everybody to love Jesus and and that's cool, but that ain't going to happen here on earth. In heaven, yeah. But here on earth, guess what? He called us to take steps of faith. He called us to be a light to people. Not to judge people. I, I don't condemn them. I'm like, oh, get away. I'm like, man, I, my heart is breaking for you. Because your identity is in Christ. The word says that he made, you know, made us in his image, male and female. That's who you are. That's, you're male. You're female. You're God's creation. He loves you with passionate love like no other. But we have to take a step of faith. And that's honestly, that's one of the most exciting things of why even we're here with you guys. I love this church. I love what God is doing through you guys. I love that you have a pastor who's willing to go for it. You know, we're, we're, we're small, but we're mighty because Jesus is, is on our side, right? Gideon didn't need 10,000 people. He didn't need that because God was on his side. And so this group right here, just think about it. If we all took even half of this stuff and took it to heart and challenged ourselves, how much different would this church be? How much different would our community be? How much different would our families be? It's just taking God's word at heart and taking steps of faith. And the path sometimes is twisty, turvy. Sometimes it goes and it goes this way. But my trust isn't in the path. My trust is in the promise that God said he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And sometimes those things come against us and we freak out and our heart gets all discouraged and dysfunction and all that kind of stuff. But you know what, church? 
God is on your side. So I want to close with this. I want to give us a few questions to challenge us today. So if you're taking notes, write these down, think about them, you know, meditate upon them. Four things. How do I need to incline my heart today? What area, what specific thing in my heart is is needing to be, maybe I've been too casual, maybe I've been too lax, maybe my heart's over here, there, whatever. Where do I need to reset my heart? Where do I need to reset? Maybe, you know, and we all have stuff. I, I, I can go on and make a whole list of just my stuff. How about number two? What do I need to hate so that I can change? Maybe it's something that I've just kind of not really hated, but I just disliked. I need to hate it. Hate it to the point that it's going to cause me to change. Now, I know hate's a powerful word, and sometimes we don't think it's in the Bible, but it is. Because God hates sin, but he loves the sinner. Amen? I'm thankful for that, because I'm thankful that I don't get that hate and his wrath, when, you know, because he loves me, and he wants me to change, but he hates my sin. I love that about our God. So don't ever confuse the two. He never hates you. Never, never, never will. Where is my hiding place? Where do I go to? Where do I run to? Where do I, where do I turn to in times of trouble? Where do I turn to when things get crazy radical? Where do I go? Do I go hang out with the guys at the bar? Do I go hang out with people that I shouldn't? Do I do this? Do I do that? Do I get on, on, on social media and invent my frustration? I, I don't know. What is it that you do? God says, I want to be your hiding place. I want to cover you. I want your heart to be perfect and right, upright, inclined. The last thing is, what's the condition of my hope? Is it active or is it passive? Remember, I hope is active. I have hope is passive. I'm waiting for it. I hope is going to charge that situation and go, man, I know God is with me. And I'm going to go for it because his promises are for me. Who can be against me? Amen? Amen. Isn't this exciting, guys? I mean, honestly, we live in a day and age where God has given us an opportunity in Orange County to make a radical difference for Jesus. And I am super stoked and excited to be with you guys here. I think this is going to be a great season of God just pruning and shaping and molding us and taking radical steps of faith. I love that. Think about what God would do in your life as he would use you to be a part of that. And maybe you have been, and that's great. But I think God wants to continue to use it and use it even more and be in, in, in areas maybe where God maybe is stretching you a little bit. Because he used, how many of you guys remember Stretch Armstrong? <laughs> you guys ever have one when you're growing up? You know, here, here, take of you. We actually ripped one as kids. We were that bad. We were just like, you know, it's like we, we, we were determined to do that. And we did it. But stretch Armstrong, man, to stretch, right? God wants to stretch us sometimes. And he wants to, to mold us and shape us into his image daily. So I would encourage you guys to pray about that.